Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is magic in, in the title of the talk. And I had worked on several iterations of a title, and it, was just, it just kept, it, it, it wouldn't stick. It's like, yeah, you know, these words. Uh, and then I had written down, does making the kernel harder um, make it more difficult to use the system? Or um, does fixing bugs in the kernel make it harder? To, and then it was like, wait a second, if I take this sentence from here and this sentence from here, and I use a lot fewer words, and, but I use them more often, and, <laughs> and uh, it's like, okay, it clicked. It's like, I don't even have to write the abstract. Like, this, is a, this is a shoe in. Um, so who am I? I'm Casey Schaufler. I've been doing uh, kernel development for 40 years. I've been doing security development for 30. And you'd think I'd have learned by now. So why don't we think that the kernel is hard? It's like, why do we think it's soft? Or why, don't, you know, why do we think we need to harden it? Well, the reality is it's really easy to do damage. Uh, we've got buffer overflows. We've got index underwriting. We've got um, reference counters that fall off the edge. Uh, it's just really easy come up with things that cause your, your system harm. Uh, and if that's not bad enough, uh, the people who want to do damage are just too damn clever. Uh, and they have a huge toolkit. Um, they know about buffer overflows. They know about invalid parameters. Um, they've got, they even invented return-oriented programming, um, which is now being used in legitimate purposes. Uh, they have got financial incentives these days, too. If you can get into uh, some of these social media sites, uh, you can get credit card numbers, you can get um, information you can use to, to steal identities, uh, you can even get bitcoins. Okay, there may not be financial incentive there, but <laughs> not to the extent it w that, that it was at one point. Um, but you get the idea, there's, there's actually incentive. Um, things you can do, yeah, there, there's incentive to do it, and there are a lot of things you can do. Well, that's not new, uh, is it? That's like, surely this didn't all, all come up in the past year since Spectre and Meltdown. Um, and you, no, it isn't. Um, it's as old as the C compiler. Uh, I started writing C code in 1977. Uh, with the original Kernahan Ritchie book, which I still have. And the C language was a massive milestone in computer science because it was neither the stupidity of writing in assembler nor the constraint of writing in Algol. How many of you have ever written Algol? How about Pascal? Brave, okay, so. <laughs> no, the, the, the thing with, the, with those languages that you learn early on is that you have to think in terms of the mindset of the language before you start doing your task. Because if you don't, you're going to get to the point where it's like, all right, I'm, yeah, everything is done except how do I do this little bit right here? And that little bit right there means the program will never work. Okay, but C doesn't, you don't have that kind of problem. Uh, why don't you have that kind of problem? Because it just, what it does is it adds memory organization and control flow to your basic assembler kind of stuff. Um, and it lets you do the things you need to do while helping you out with the stuff that you, you would just have to be doing over and over and over again if you were writing an assembler. Um, it's efficient and it's convenient. Um, you can do all sorts of things that, uh, that most languages don't let you do because it doesn't really care that much. Um, one of my favorites here is the one where you have a header and the last thing, a header, a data structure, which is a header, the very last thing is it has is an array with, an, with one element in it. Now, of course, what you really do is you go out and you allocate a bunch of memory and you put as many of those things there as, as you have space for. 
Um, and then when you're done, you throw away the, the whole chunk of memory. You're not constrained by the data typing of the language to have exactly the right number. So every, everything is fine. That makes things really convenient. And it's really efficient. You can also be very clever and very precise with the language in ways that, again, a, other languages just don't let you do. Um, this is actual Linux kernel code. Um, and it's, it's a structure where you, where you have um, a TCP header and an array of bytes. And why do you do this? So that you can, it's a, well, it's a union here. Um, it's so that you can go into that third one and set the value on it because you have to do that sometimes. You have to go in and say, I have this big structure of data here and I want to get to this little bit right here without going through all the convolutions of telling the language that what I want is this part of it. I don't want to have to define a data structure that's got all those bits in it. Ugh, just give me the bytes. Okay. And why would I want to give that up? Uh, it's like, the answer is you probably wouldn't. Um, strong type languages have their own set of problems. Uh, again, you know, there are times where you just can't express the thing you want to do in a single data structure. Um, anybody here done serious object-oriented programming? Okay. What do you think about garbage collection? You want to have garbage collection in the kernel? <laughs> okay, yeah, the, the image there is like, okay, here we go. We're about to launch the disk, the disk drive. Oh, wait a second here. We just got to free up some memory here. Okay, we're done. It just, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like a really good use of system resources to do that on a regular basis. And probably the biggest reason is that the code base is really, really big. Even if we had a, perf a perfect language, you know, Rust, um, Corrosion, something like that. You know. <laughs> um, even if we had the perfect programming language, you would still have to convert the whole code base. And you can do it mechanically, it's, but, but the 90-90 rule will apply, which is that the, the first 90% of the time gets you 90% of the code, and that last 10% of the code takes you the other 90% of the time. And of course, you've got patches coming in during the whole time, and you got a, a, yeah, it, it's just too much code to, to really try to do that. And you, again, you would have to have a perfect language in order to, uh, to justify doing that. So I don't think we're gonna see that anytime soon. And strong typing is for weak minds. And I've seen this attributed to several people, but I've just put up the two most likely. So that said, there are things we can do. Um, we can use the typing that's available. Um, uh, we can fix things that we know are dangerous. And of course, we can be, be prepared that things are going to fail at some point. You know, be a little bit proactive. Yeah, put on the, the steel toe boot when you're out playing with the ax. It just kind of makes sense to do that. So typing. How does typing help? Uh, it's like, yeah, I, I just you know, ragged on typing for, for five minutes here. Um, but we do have typing, and typing does have its, have its uses and its advantages. Uh, I'll use the example here of the ref count T. A reference count, something you put on a data structure so you can determine that nobody's using it anymore, and so you can free it. Um, they have some special properties, and, you can, and because you're using um, a type for it, you can track it based on those properties. Uh, for example, it should never go to zero. Um, you should never directly assign to it. So you should only increment it or decrement it. Um, and by making it a, a special type, you can actually keep it in, under control. And you can, if, if you make something that isn't one of these, a ref count you can figure, out, figure that out eventually. So um, you can figure out that your reference counting actually works by using one of these things. So what do we know is dangerous? 
Anybody want to guess um, what the most dangerous thing in the entire Linux kernel is? All the code. All the code. <laughs> no, 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 you silly people. It's strings. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and this goes back to the, the, the philosophy early on. It's like, yeah, the people who did the original C language and the original Unix systems thought seriously about how they were going to represent strings. When you have 48K of memory for both your data and your text of, of your operating system, you really care about how much, how much you're using to represent anything. So a, tech, uh, a, a null terminated array of characters really makes a lot of sense because you can actually use a very small amount of space to represent that. Now, is it dangerous to use? Yeah. Yeah, because, well, quite frankly, 90% of the programmers aren't among the top 10% of the programmers. And, <laughs> and they make mistakes. Um, or they're just sloppy, like me. Um, so we have string functions. and. We know they're dangerous. You have stir copy, which takes this string and copies it into this place. And if there's no null terminator on it, or it's the, the source is bigger than the destination, it writes stuff in places it shouldn't do, and that's bad. So we introduced stern copy, uh, where you say, and, and here's the maximum length. And of course, everybody then says, OK, well, I'm going to take the length of the source and I'm going to pass that in as the maximum number of bytes. You would think this was funny. <laughs> How, who, who wants to bet that if you grip the Linux kernel right now, you'll find at least five of these? Hmm? Okay, no, um, now, the good news is most of them are in the device drivers. <laughs> for, hopefully for devices you're not using. Um, but you never know. And of course, they've done, we've got all, got all kinds of helper functions that you can put around these so that, you know, to make them safer, but usually they actually just boil down to this, the second example here, uh, where you end up copying things over stuff anyway. Uh, you just have to be more careful. Right. Um, next thing that's dangerous are automatic arrays. Slightly different implementation of the same problem, which is to say, I'm going to call into my function here, and I don't know how big, you know, how many elements I'm going to be going to need to, to work on. So I'm going to let the you know, make that a parameter, and whatever comes in, I'm going to have my array that size. Um, now, heaven forbid, somebody somebody in the calling stack above it has said, hey, there's an error here, so I'm going to return a negative number. Uh, in which case, that be, that's an unsigned value, and um, all of a sudden your system gets really, really, really slow uh, while it's allocating this enormous thing on the stack. Um, but good, good news is um, there, there's work <laughs> ongoing to get, get rid of all of these. I think we're, okay, so are we down, are, are they all gone? They're all gone. No way, yeah, yeah, yes, that, that's also a problem. Um, and the reality is that this doesn't happen, well, again, it doesn't happen anymore, it's not a problem anymore, but it has been in the past. Um, casts, all right, casts are without a doubt the single most abused feature of the C language. A cast says, I know that this data type and this data type are not the same, but treat them the same anyway. No, treat them as if they are the same anyway. Um, most times that people use casts, or I take in the beginning of learning how to program in C, most people who use casts use them incorrectly because the language will take care of most type conversions for you. The time you, 
when you want to use a cast is when you know that this is different from this, but I want to use the properties of this type on the data for that type. All right, so the first, first one here, we say, hey, I've got a, a credential structure, that's great. I'm going to point it at the address of this variable called i. Let's say i is an integer. I can assure you that the credential structure is bigger than an integer on most systems. Itanium, we'll, we'll, we'll get to. <laughs> um, but it's just as dangerous in the other direction because you can point a, um, a, you can cast a pointer to a structure that's bigger than the one you're using. You go off and you do a bunch of changes here and there's the bunch of stuff that you never touched which may have garbage in it, or may have secrets in it, may have all kinds of stuff in it, you may actually introduce exploits by being careful to not go over your end. So, yeah, there's danger in these things. Um, this other one here, anybody want to make a guess at what this is supposed to do? Go bang. Go bang is a good guess, but it's not correct. No, this is, this is an attempt to truncate the value of temp. Now, why you don't just go and mask it, I don't know. Um, somebody thought this was really, really clever, and uh, probably re is really, really clever. I've been programming in C for a long time, and I don't pretend to understand why they did it that way. Um, so, it's not that you can't use these things safely. You can, all right? Um, but in, in the, when you get to a point where you're looking at, the, at this particular line of code, a lot of times you don't know where, where the information, where the variables you're using, or the information you're using to, to actually compute things came from. So if, you're, if you've got a string, a string manipulating function and you've got 400 callers, fine, you want to put a check in there to make sure that, that it's within range. But you know, that's gonna slow things down a whole lot for all, the, all these places. So why, why don't I just put the checks out in the places to call it? Well, there are 400 of them. And they're adding one in every device driver. And it's like, uh, yeah, where do you wanna do the check? Yeah we, yeah, we can do a check here, we can do a check here, but we're not gonna do a check in either place because there are too many places here and it's too inefficient if we do it here. So, you end up with the, with the snake and the mongoose and you know, somebody's gonna lose. So while, we, while we're talking about stacks, that was one of my best segues. Um, <laughs> um, anybody know who invented stacks? This, this man, okay. Um, nice thing about stacks is that they're really easy to implement in hardware. Um, it's, it's really obvious how they work. Um, everything is, is simple, you push things on it, you pop things off of it, um, hardware is accelerated, everybody's happy, right? Well, they're convenient for mucking things up too. And why is that? Um, because you know where things are relative to each other, you can actually reach around the stack and find, oh, you know, my caller called, with, called me with this, but I, want to know what else he had up, up in his stack because um, that might be interesting to me. So um, because we, we know where things are relative to each other, we can muck things up. If we put something too big, copy something into a stack, <laughs> onto the stack that's too big, then we muck up uh, what, ha what our callers are. And this, this gives us opportunities for things like um, changing the return address if that's out on the stack, so we don't actually return to where we came from, we return somewhere else. Uh, very, very good for debuggers, very good for hackers. And, but there are things we can do about that. That's not so hard. Uh, we can make it harder by putting gaps between the, the segments of the stack. Uh, we can put canaries out there so that um, you know when you've gone past it, or when somebody's gone past it. Um, 
we can release, erase what's no longer, 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 no longer needed. So for example, you call a function, you come back from the function, on the way out you erase uh, its stack. That way you can't go find out what, what was there before, remove the temptation. This, uh, this is a little bit more expensive, but uh, actually can provide you some, some help. Whoop. Okay, so, not on stacks, I have a random thought. Let's randomize some things. Okay, so both attackers and developers hate randomization. Okay, if it's good for a, for a hacker, it's good for a debugger. If it's good for a debugger, it's good for a hacker. Um, they're really different uses of the same technologies. You're solving the same problem, but to different means, or to different ends. Um, so, real addresses, how often do you actually need a real address? That's like, yes, it, <laughs> if you're trying to, to, to go through your code and you've calculated out all the addresses and you're, you're trying to piece things together like that, uh, you should be using a debugger at that point. Um, and debugger technology can, can use real addresses, but you don't need them in your, in your log, system logs. Um, symbolic values or hashed values work just as well. Um, and the logs are less useful if you actually, again, have the memory map in your, in your brain. Um, I haven't done that in a long time, not since I used a computer that was bigger than about yet. Um, So randomization is something we can do to actually make it a bit harder to look at things you shouldn't be seeing. We randomize data structures. Uh, this has a few uh, implications. Uh, for example, uh, alignment structures can get bigger. Uh, there was actually one case I heard of where things, where it, a, random, a particular instance of randomization made things run, run better. Uh, it was a met, well, it, talk to a net networking person about cache lines sometime. Um, you will learn many things, um, not many of them useful, but you will learn about ca um, yeah, cache lines are, are, can be extremely critical and if you can keep things in the cache when you're performing a, a set of complex operations, uh, you can really speed things up considerably. Now this particular instance we've got, we've got pointers and we've got um, various sized integers and when we flip them out over together they, they get bigger because you're got padding in order to make things align properly. Your architecture will, will uh, matter too. Some architectures are better at, at uh, misunaligned um, integers than others. But that's the way, that's what hardware people are for. They do that kind of stuff. Um, we have this uh, available now. You can actually specify whether you're going to allow or disallow randomization, uh, explicitly allow it or explicitly disallow it, because there are some data structures where you really don't want to be, be flipping things around, things like the task. Okay, and stack pages, hey, remember them? They're just pages. Well, there really isn't any good reason that they have to be in particular orders. Uh, the hardware is good enough in most cases these days, where you can shuffle it around, you put, put these things anywhere, and that way you're going to, you know, somebody who's out looking saying, if I go up 14 bytes from here, I'm going to be able to get, get the information I want, ha ha, well, it may not be there. Who knows what's, what is there, but yeah, what you're looking for isn't there. Functions are another thing. Now, you, how, how much value does this get you? And I think the answer here is, going to say quite a bit because if you're if you're you have a system that's running and you desperately want to get at a particular set of information you're going to have have looked done your research and you know which functions can give you keys and clues to getting that information but if you don't know and if you know where they are relative to each other you can just go go find them you can do, do all sorts of, of uh, quick searches quick quick hashing on that and find things if you don't know where the function, where any given function is going to be, that makes it a lot harder. That means you have to do that research of where they are relative to each other every time you want to go do an attack. Now, 
performance. Do I have to, do I really, I'm just like, do I have to worry about performance? <sighs> yes, you do. Um, secure, the biggest dig that the rest of the kernel community, the rest of the software community in general has had about security is performance. It's like, I'm, <laughs> Anybody use a, a chip lately that's been uh, despectorized? Um, sometimes they run a bit. They, they run a bit slower. Now, the reality here is what you've done is you said we found a bug in in the way this chip works, and we made it so it works properly now. But in order to do that, we had to take off some of these clever tricks that worked most of the, for most things, but really didn't work well enough. So performance um, is a big deal. Yeah, there's been an awful lot about it again on Spectrum, Spectrum Meltdown. I'll tell you a true story. This happened to me. I wanted to put some security, security magic into in the uh, TCP IP stack on a, on a Unix system. And so I wrote the code very carefully, made sure that it was not in the way, and I went to the, the maintainer and I said, okay, I'd like to check this in. And he said, nope, can't do that. I said, well, why not? And he said, well, uh, you haven't measured the performance impact. I said, yeah, there isn't any. No, your benchmarks aren't good enough. Well, okay, so several iterations on this. Finally, we've got a new piece of super, super duper fast hardware. And in one error condition, we were able to get a 2% performance degradation with the security code in it. I said, okay, I've got good enough benchmarks now. I can check it in, right? He said, nope, it's got performance impact. Okay, fine. So I actually went off and fixed his code so that it didn't have performance impact anymore. And I came back and said, okay, no performance impact, right? He said, nope, why not? Well, obviously your benchmarks aren't good enough. Because you can't detect performance impact, your benchmarks aren't good enough. So I was like, okay. He's now driving a tractor in Colorado. <laughs> That's fine. Um, but why is it we have this is so much friction? Well, one of the reasons we have friction is that performance is gonna trump security more often than not and the biggest reason for this is that performance is quantitative. It's easy to measure performance. You can tell if something is slowed down. There are, there are huge technologies available for measuring the performance. Um, you can detect a 2% impact or a 3% impact or a 20% impact. Um, security, on the other hand, is quantum. So we have I call it four. Uh, I've heard, heard other, other numbers uh, argued, but if you don't, if, if you're pretty confident that there's no vulnerability here, nobody's going to put any thought into it at all. If somebody has a hypothetical example of how it could be, a, how there could be a vulnerable, there are a few people who might care a little bit, but you're still pretty much flat on the line. Even if you demonstrate a vulnerability, there are only a few people, yeah, that will, that will be, huh, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, we'll put it in the backlog. Okay. But when it's exploited, you have everybody's attention. Uh, when it shows up in the Wall Street Journal or Time Magazine or on fa everybody's fa Facebook page as their eyeballs being turned inside, it, you, people notice that, okay? So when we're talking about the performance security issue, what that means is performance, we're working on that every day. Security, we work on it when it happens. Um, and so the people who have been grinding away day after day, getting, you know, tweaking performance, all of a sudden we come in and say, okay, all that, all that performance gain you, you've worked on for the past three years, ha, 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 out the window, sorry. Um, and then they cry and, well, yeah, that's what they get for working in performance. Uh, so, is it worth the bother? It's like, 
we put an awful lot of work on into these things to, to get the system a little bit better, um, taking some proactive steps. Is it really worth it? I mean, how often do we actually really have these problems? Um, and what are the costs of doing this? Well, first off, there's code churn. Um, sometimes, yeah, let's just hypothetically say we wanted to fix the, uh, the C string problem once and for all and introduce a data structure, which is a, a text string with links and pointers and verification and all that. How much work would we have to do in order to put that in place? Is there anybody here who thinks that that would actually, could actually be, be done in a year? Okay. okay. I do too, but it would require a concentrated effort and a whole lot of more cooperation than I think we're going we're to see anytime soon. I don't know that, and I don't know that it would be worth it. But it might be. Um, just to use the example of, of the ref count T, uh, there are 180 files that now have ref count T's in them. There are over 500 instances of reference counts, ref count T's. And there's still a whole lot of stuff out there that needs to be converted. Okay. That's a lot of work for something that, that you might question whether it actually adds significant value. Uh, there's runtime overhead. Um, we have things like hardened user copy, where we do a bunch of checks to make sure that the data we're pulling down from user space is really coming from user space, and that the data that's being pulled out of the system and going into user space is in fact coming from someplace legitimate. Um, there are checks in a lot of that, okay, you're adding checks to every system call, or well, potentially every system call, in order to do this. Is that worth it? It's like, there's a lot of overhead in there. I've got, I've got my IoT device here. I've got a processor in here. It's like, how much security checking does this guy really need to do? Answer in this room, it's a Bluetooth device. It's got a laser on it. I don't want it hacked. So it's got, it, it does, does want to have some security on it. Um, but I also want it to work well. I, I want it to work and not, not drain the battery. Um, and the other thing we need always have to keep, in, keep in, in mind is the developer experience. How many of you are developers? Okay, let me ask it another way. How many of you are not developers? Okay. Um, the, the experience of doing development is critical in order to get development done. If doing development is really, really, really hard, people aren't going to do it. People are going to go off and build um, Raspberry Pi boards instead. Yeah, or they're gonna make little IoT T dragsters that go around boo -boo, and annoy people in shopping malls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, we want to use that creativity for good. <laughs> um, so we have to maintain a developer experience. And again, this can be, be as simple as things like check patch. Okay, how many people here have run check patch? Okay, very good. How many people thought it was going to be, it was really annoying the first time they did it? Okay, how many people, how many of you now appreciate the fact that it finds bugs for you? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, it can be as simple as that. Um, it can be, but it can also be really picky -yune. Like, I, I, I need to, to log something, I'm gonna, it'll be real helpful here if I have, have a, a unique identifier, I'll just print the pointer. Well, it's not gonna actually give you the pointer value anymore, it's going to give you a, a hashed value of it. Eh, really? It's like, if I really want, okay, well, I, I really want the pointer. Okay, why do you really want the pointer? Because that, you're introducing a security flaw. Uh, maybe I don't really need the pointer, but I don't wanna have to think about it. Okay, that's fine. Um, the other thing is uh, things like compiler warnings. We've turned on a lot of compiler warnings these days. How many of you remember Lint? <sighs> okay, uh, used to be you had to run a separate program in order for it to, to say anything other than question mark if there was a, um, an error in your, in your program. Um, 
now it's all integrated in and it, it tells you, hey, uh, I bet you that this variable over here is, you're not supposed to be using that signed int and this unsigned int for the same thing. Oh, yeah, of course, fine. You could make this a const, you know. Yeah, I could. Hey, hey, and it could be static too, yeah, okay, and now my declaration for foo is, you know, yay long because it's, a, it's an init const static foo. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but th those things actually, you know, these are things that actually make things better for developers. So we, tr we need to do that when we can. So in the end, what we're really saying here is, Hardware is subjective, okay? Is the kernel more secure now than it, than it was five years ago? Yeah, I think so. Um, is it harder to develop on the kernel than it was five years ago? Some aspects of it are more difficult. Some aspects are a whole lot better. So it's gonna be subjective. I mean, if, if you really are a slapdash coder, uh, who doesn't care about consts and stats and that your, your types match and things like that, uh, you're gonna have one experience and uh, if, if you're already meticulous, uh, it's, you're just gonna say, hey, other people are being more meticulous too. This is great. Uh, so the answer to the original question then, yes, it is harder. Um, we're putting more burden on kernel developers to be more responsible. Uh, the good news though is the community's buying in. Uh, there was a very long time where nobody really wanted to, con to, to, uh, to pay, the, pay attention to it. But now people are starting to see the benefits, the quality improvement, um, the fact that the other guy isn't stomping on them any, as much as they used to. Uh, working in the open is huge. Um, how many of you remember GR security? It used to be a thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, because they would not go work with the community to move that forward, it is now pretty much irrelevant. Um, the work that we're doing in the community these days is, is it getting, getting, is there as much code there? No. On the other hand, we know it's gonna be there in the next release because it's, it's upstream. Uh, other people are starting to think, in, think with a more secure mindset because they see what's going on around them. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I should, hey, I've got a ref count T here. Hey, I've got a ref count. Hey, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna write my own checking, I'll just use this, this is great. Okay. Uh, the amount of help we've been able to get doing the kernel hardening has been, has been amazing. Because as soon as you come out and say, this is going to have this, it's gonna add value in, in these places, people start to say, huh, oh, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, we've gotten people who submitting patches because they, they see a couple of patches that do something and they say, hey, I found 400 other places where it's doing the same thing, so here are some more patches to pick that up. And it's like, oh good, I'm glad I didn't have to go looking for those. Um, and uh, we're all still learning you know, where the bounds are between security and performance and spiffy new features and the C language and assembler and uh, eBPF and all kinds of other uh, bizarre and unnatural things that were going on. Um, because we've got change, and change is good. Uh, we fear it, but it's good anyway. Um, and as we're learning things, yeah, learning is good, we're moving forward. So that's all I've got to, got to say on this, but I'm happy to answer questions that you have about um, the hardness of the curve. Okay, I've got a question over here. No. <laughs> so, 
Sorry, I always wanted things to that do can't that. be written in BPF, uh, but still complex error prone in C. Do you see a place for an, another language in the kernel, whether it be Rust, whether it be Java, <laughs> scripts? Okay, so do I see a place for another language in the kernel? And um, back in my youth, when, <laughs> when dinosaurs roamed the earth and uh, mainframes were 32-bit machines, seriously, um, I wrote, a, wrote device drivers for the, the system 360. You wrote these device drivers in channel programming language. So you actually wrote a channel, uh, wrote, wrote a program, you, you wrote a little program which you then put into the, you know, wrote, you wrote it to the controller and the controller executed the, the program. Uh, it, very much like a BPF today. Um, as far as something like C++ or Java or JavaScript or Node.js, um, we will see it. Um, I th would be very surprised if there isn't somebody in the building today um, who's got patches in the, in the works for running some sort of interpreted lang general purpose interpreted language in the kernel for, so that they can do their device drivers in Node.js. So that you can pick, pick, go out, you know, just go out, go out to the web and pick uh, your favorite six and try them to see which one you like best, in which version, today. And your system boots up and goes out to the, you know, goes out to the web, gets the device drivers for the disk. Um, I don't think it'll show up in Linux because I think that um, that would be counter to the current. Maintain, maintainer's mindset. And I, personally, I think that's a good thing. I think that keeping it in one language uh, tends to focus and prevent some of the weird drift you see in other systems. Um, it would be, if we decided, <clears throat> if at some point, um, we Linux actually went to a microkernel, for example. It's not going to. Yeah, the, the hypothetical. Okay, the Linux alike, the, the system that's like Linux but is a microkernel. Why not do the disk driver in, in Node.js, other than, than the fact that it's completely insane? Uh, <laughs> and this brings us way back to the, the beginning here, which is that this is why we use C, because C really, you know, as the, the language has evolved over the past 40 years to be an even better language for systems programming. And nobody has ever done a systems programming language that compares. Any others? You got one down here. Ah, sorry, I, I, I don't didn't know see if you that. care about this guy. <laughs> I mean, without the flashy shirt, how can you tell? So I wasn't being silly about your security. I still have a server running it. Uh, hasn't been hacked yet. Uh, but the question was more, is there anything left in GR security that was worthwhile that hasn't been put into the kernel yet because it was too much work to take out? OK, so the question is, uh, is there anything left in GR security that we should, should bring in that we haven't done yet? Yes. Uh, the pro one of the problems with GR security has always been that it is not a collection of of improvements. It's one big massive um, entangled thing that improves a whole lot of stuff. So pulling individual bits out in upstreamable chunks is really, really, really hard. So in addition to that, even if you went in and you pulled out all of the individual hunks, you'd still have the big, big pile of stuff left. And the question is, is that infrastructure? Is that unnecessary infrastructure? You know, what is it? So the answer to the question is that there's stuff that's so hard to pull out, so hard to individually identify, 
that it will probably never come in in the form it is there. Okay. Uh, there'll be other mitigations that take care of the same, that address the same problem. Um, there will be other system changes that may make those issues just go away completely. Um, but we'll never really know because in part of, in part because of, to use English, um, in part because of the way that whole thing was, and the, the whole problem with it, which is that you couldn't just take the whole thing, but you had to take the whole thing. Um, we're out of time now, so thank you again, Casey. Thank you.